We're going to have uh, the Chancellor, Dr. Barish, uh, just start off uh, this morning's festivities. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Barish. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Uh, before we begin, uh, I would really like to have uh, Robert and Judith Levy stand. You know, this is the 12th symposium. And I can just say that LSU can have no finer friends or supporters, both for the Department of Neurosurgery and as an institution as a whole. So thank you all you do for us. Uh, we're really indebted to you. So good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to LSU Health Shreveport, and especially our guest speaker, Dr. Daniel Barrow from Emory. You know, there's a joke I know that Dr. Nanda knows that uh, Emory's still undefeated in football, I think, since, what, 1876? Because, right? Because they never have had a football team. So <laughs> that's quite a record. But thank you uh, so much for coming to share this fascinating topic about microsurgical management of neurovascular disorders. Now, before you get started, I want to take a minute to brag on our department, as is the uh, custom here in the South, as you know, the Department of Neurosurgery. A few facts. We are very proud of the fact that Dr. Nan and his group have the largest neurosurgery practice in Louisiana, academic or private. Today, the department has eight surgeons, each specializing in a different area of the specialty. Patients from throughout the state and well beyond come here because of the expertise of this faculty. Last year, a patient actually traveled from Israel to Shreveport on the advice of a physician friend just so she could be treated by Dr. Nanda. He's not only a wonderful neurosurgeon in his own right, but Dr. Nanda has also done an outstanding job building the departments since he was recruited here from private practice. In fact, his hiring signified a rebirth for neurosurgery at LSU Health, leading to the creation of the department in 1955. University Neurosurgery now has the largest neurosurgery residency program in Louisiana accepting two residents every year for the seven-year program. The department has the only fellowship-trained pediatric neurosurgeon in the region. Last year, with the addition of a functional neurosurgeon, the Surgical Movement Disorders Clinic was established, aiding capabilities for deep brain stimulation, surgery, and comprehensive treatment for movement disorders. In 2000, University Neurosurgery became the first in northern Louisiana to have a gamma knife. Since then, more than 1,200 gamma knife procedures have been performed, and we celebrated this week. And actually, uh, there's a one-year anniversary for the upgrade of the equipment uh, that was just celebrated as well. Along with the gamma knife, a neurointerventional suite opened in 2007 for 3D rotational angiography, road mapping, and CT scans. When it comes to research, University of Neurosurgery is the highest NIH-funded medical school department in the state and 30th among all U.S. medical schools, according to 2014 NIH ranking tables. In 2014, 42 manuscripts were published in peer-reviewed journals. Also last year, Dr. Guang Li, Associate Professor of Neurosurgery and Physiology, received a $1.6 million grant from NIH for his work on stroke treatment and prevention. Of course, Dr. Nanda has also built an international reputation for the program lecturing around the world. Because of the high esteem he is held by his peers, Dr. Nand is frequently asked to lecture and speak. In fact, in 2014, at the invitation of the Ministry of Health of Kuwait, he spent a week teaching and operating in Kuwait City. So I could go on for a long time if I listed all the department accomplishments, but I will cut this short so you can get on with your program. Again, thanks for coming and enjoy your day. Thank you. Now, if all that was true, I would believe it. But <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniel Barrow, a great friend who's our Levy professor this year. He's a native of Illinois. He went to Westminster College, which is famous where Winston Churchill gave his great address. He went to Southern Illinois uh, Medical School, and he got the Distinguished Alumni Award from both of those institutions. He then went to Emory, and he did his neurosurgery residency there. He trained further at the Mayo Clinic and to the Barrow Neurological Institute, and he did his uh, neurology at the Mass General at Harvard. He then had a meteoric rise in neurosurgery, became the chairman and, the M and head of the MBNA Stroke Center at Emory, and has been professor and chairman for the last 20 years. He's probably one of the, I think, one of the best vascular surgeons in the world, period. 
And I think he's a neurosurgeon's neurosurgeon. You send him the cases that we can't figure out what to do with. Uh, he's a very accomplished academician for the med students. He's published over 250 book chapters and peer-reviewed uh, papers. He's written several books, including an authoritative text on neurosurgery. But besides all that being a clinical maestro, he's the quintessential triple threat. He's an excellent researcher, a great technical virtuoso surgeon, but he's also done a lot for academic, for organized neurosurgery. The Congress of Neurological Surgeons, he headed that. He was the president of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and took sort of an organization which was a junior partner of the AANS and made it very financially stable. He's been on the ABNS, the board of uh, neurological surgeons, with secretary and the chair. Uh, so he's really done a lot for neurosurgery. We're very indebted. He's a talented person, uh, a wonderful human being, and I always kid him, he's the only physician in, uh, in the South that's been on the cover of Atlanta Magazine twice on its best doctor's uh, issue. Uh, but he's a very kind person, and as I always kid him, his better half is an oral surgeon, Molly, and she'll be there with us tonight as well. So without much further ado, Dr. Daniel Barrow. Thank you, Anil, for embellishing my accomplishments. I'm sorry that guy you introduced couldn't be here today, but I'll try to step in for him. Um, it is a real honor and a pleasure to be here. And before I begin, I really want to again thank the Levy family for their support of uh, the institution and this lectureship. And um, uh, thank you so much for showing up and coming. I hope what I have to say, uh, I hope the blood, <laughs> blood in my videos doesn't, uh, doesn't disturb you. But, um, so the, the subject that I wanted to talk about today uh, is to put into perspective my, uh, my personal view of what the role of microsurgery will be uh, in, in the future. Um, Yogi Berra uh, was a part-time baseball player and full-time philosopher who once said, um, I don't like to make predictions, especially about the future, uh, but I'm going to attempt to do that. I'm going to attempt to make a prediction about the future and put in perspective uh, where the role of microsurgery will be. This is a list, just a very simple list, of most of the things that we as neurovascular surgeons take care of. And every one of these things has a non-surgical alternative. And oftentimes those non-surgical alternatives are less invasive, they're more appealing to the patient. And in the past, all we had to do as surgeons was beat the natural history of the disease. Today we have to beat the natural history and we have to demonstrate that we have a better option than some of these other options that are available. But let me remind you that despite the dramatic improvements that have occurred uh, in endovascular therapy, radiosurgery, these less invasive techniques, the field of microsurgery is not a static field, and this slide lists a number of advances that have been developed in the field of microsurgery during Anil's and my uh, career, things that really didn't exist uh, or were in their infancy at the beginning of our careers. So I'm going to go through some of the things we take care of and try to put in perspective where I think surgery is. For arteriovenous malformations of the brain, I believe that the majority of arteriovenous malformations that need treatment uh, are best treated by surgical extirpation. The benefit of surgery is that it's immediately and permanently curative. Once you remove an AVM, you've eliminated forever the risk of the malformation bleeding again, which is the major threat. You reduce the risk of seizures in people that present with epilepsy, uh, and there's no routine maintenance as opposed to embolization, which is rarely curative, it's a great adjunct to surgery, radiosurgery has the benefit of being less invasive, but there are a relatively small number of AVMs that are suitable for radiosurgery, and there's a long delay until uh, the benefits are achieved. What I do want to do, however, is talk about a recent randomized trial called Aruba. Uh, which is the randomized trial of unruptured brain arteriovenous malformations, which I think uh, was a travesty. The fact that this was published uh, in a reputable journal, I think, um, uh, deserves a, a moment of comment. Now, whenever a surgeon uh, dis discusses a paper that demonstrates no benefit for surgery, always you have to be concerned about self-serving interests. But bear with me, and I'll, I'll, I'll t I think you'll understand why this is concerning. So in this study, there were 1,740 patients screened, and 726 were deemed ineligible for, uh, or eligible, the rest ineligible for reasons that were not clear in the paper. 
Uh, 323 refused to enroll, and 177 had their management decision made by the treating team outside the randomization process. So immediately the randomization process is a little bit suspect. The primary outcome, and these patients were randomized either to treatment or no treatment, uh, the outcome was death or symptomatic stroke. Secondary outcome was clinical impairment, a modified rank and score of greater than two. Remember, the higher the score, the worse the outcome. This study was stopped prematurely after randomizing 226 patients. And you can see how they were randomized, 114 to intervention and 109 to no uh, treatment. In the intervention group, and this is very important, five patients were treated with neurosurgical procedures. 30 underwent embolization, which is not a curative treatment. 31 with radiotherapy, which takes two to three years to have benefit, and 28 with multimodality therapy. This primary endpoint was achieved in 30% of the patients randomized to treatment and 10% of the patients managed without any treatment. Obviously, we should never treat AVMs based upon uh, this uh, information. And you can see the secondary outcome was achieved in 46% of patients. This is the modified Rankin score of greater than two and a much smaller group of patients managed medically. So the authors conclude that medical management is superior to intervention in preventing death or stroke in patients with unruptured AVMs followed for 33 months. So here are the concerns. The authors completely failed to explain why there are such a large number of eligible patients were not enrolled into the study. The study design lacks any standardization for the treatment arms. In other words, if the patient randomized a treatment, the treating physician could do whatever he or she wanted. A recent large-scale meta-analysis reported that the obliteration rates of 96% for surgical resection of AVMs, 38% for radiosurgery, and 13% for embolization. Remember that because most of the patients in this study that were treated were treated with embolization. Only five patients received surgical resection alone when 76, pa 76 patients in the treatment arm had grade one or two AVMs that are associated with virtually no mortality and minimal morbidity with surgery. Embolization, as I said, is not considered to be curative, and 30 of the treated patients were managed with that alone. Of the 114 patients randomized to treatment, 53 had not even completed their therapy when the study was, was halted, and 20 had not even initiated their therapy, even though they were randomized to the treatment arm. So given the lack of information and heterogeneity regarding the therapies, it's absolutely impossible to understand what the treatment arm represents and what it's being compared to. It's irresponsible, in my opinion, to conclude the superiority of a medical management when the treatment arm provides therapies that are well below the current standard of care for eradication. And obviously, a 33-month follow-up is completely inadequate for a disease that presents a lifelong risk of hemorrhage. In fact, the fact that there was a 10% incidence of death and stroke over a time interval of less than three years in the medically treated group tells us that we need a treatment that is safe and effective. And I would argue that treatment is surgery. For dural AVMs, this is a very different story. Dural arteriovenous fistulas can certainly sometimes require surgical treatment. And this is a video of a dural fistula, which you can see in, uh, is being fed uh, here by, through the sphenoid, uh, uh, the ethmoidal vessels, and here's a draining vein. The treatment of these is to obliterate the, con the, the junction between arteries and veins. And whether you do it by embolizing this or surgically occluding it makes no difference. The fact is that most of these today are best treated by endovascular techniques, and surgery plays a relatively small role. In this case, it was much, much simpler to surgically obliterate this than it would have been to do endovascular therapy, but the majority of these are best treated by endovascular therapy. There's a rare indication, in my opinion, for radiosurgery, again, because of the long delay in the benefits of that. For cavernous malformations, this is one involving the brain stem, which you can see here, uh, surgery really is the only treatment, in my, in my opinion. Radiosurgery has been used experimentally in a couple of institutions, and the results have been, by and large, dismal. There is risk of radiation uh, to cavernous malformations, and no evidence whatsoever that it actually gets rid of the lesions. There has been some reports 
that it lowers the risk of bleeding long term, but I think that really is no different than the natural history of these lesions that we know oftentimes bleed uh, in clusters. So surgical therapy, this being one deep in the brainstem, you can see the fifth nerve uh, up below, and then the postoperative MRI showing the kind of result one can get by removing these, even in critically important areas, high-priced real estate like the, uh, the brainstem. For spinal arteriovenous malformations, I think the treatment options really depend upon what type of AVM we're talking about. There are, all, there are different types of spinal cord AVMs that dictate very different treatments. Far and away, the most common type is the dural arteriovenous fistula. This is a, a, an intraoperative photograph showing the radicular artery here. This is the fistula, that's the pathology, and these are the draining veins. This disease causes um, uh, myelopathy because of venous hypertension. And this, il this illustrates the simplicity of the surgical treatment. There's the fistula right here. That's the fistula in the dura. The artery is in the dura, and this is the vein. We routinely do ICG video angiography, which allows us to see the, the arterial blood flow into the venous system, which is the, is the cause of the venous hypertension that causes progressive damage to the spinal cord. And the treatment is, is, is absolutely simple. You literally coagulate the fistula, which is right in the dura, that's artery and that's vein, and you divide it. Um, we then repeat the ICG video angiogram, and you can see the stasis of the blood. You've eliminated the arterialization, and this is curative. Uh, untreated, this leads to um, progressive uh, uh, paralysis in every single patient. This is typical of the literature. This is from the Massachusetts General Hospital data, but you can see that with surgery, there virtually is never a recurrence of the fistula. I, I have no idea how many of these operated on. Knock on wood, I've never, ever had one recur after surgery. But you can see with embolization, over time, there is a higher risk of recurrence. And so in our institution, we have a very strong surgical bias for the treatment of these fistulas. The type 2 spinal AVM is, is like the brain AVM. This is an intraparenchymal lesion. Unlike the type 1, it is congenital, not acquired. Uh, and let me just give you a couple of examples of, uh, of those cases and how challenging they can be. But they, too, are almost always require surgical treatment. This is a, a three-year-old boy who presented with an intraparenchymal hemorrhage within his spinal cord and a brown saccard syndrome. This is his spinal angiogram, and you can see that this is one of these juvenile AVMs fed by the anterior spinal artery off of both vertebral arteries and this very fluffy AVM that was literally on the ventral surface of his spinal cord. We, um, here's the, um, the AP views, and you can see there's a, actually an aneurysm as well right here. We operated on this child from a posterior approach, literally split his, his um, dorsal columns, went all the way through the spinal cord, and I was actually looking at the anterior spinal artery with his cord hemisected, and I, I literally became nauseous when I saw this. But here is the postoperative angiogram showing a complete resection of the AVM, and this is a picture of the little boy at his postoperative visit. He was absolutely neurologically intact, which demonstrates how kids can make you really look good. They have an amazing capacity to heal. And about a year ago, I was in my office, and this boy showed up who had just graduated from college, and this is him, um, I think, about 16 or 17 years later. So um, very rewarding, and I think for the foreseeable future will remain the therapy. Now, for ventral lesions, um, particularly in adults, we don't go through the spinal cord. That was an unusual case. Here's another AVM that bled on the ventral spinal cord. And the way that we manage these is through an approach that I, I, I liken to the transcondylar approach, a, a far lateral approach. The first thing is, this is the patient's head, and this is the neck. We don't put a retractor in the wound because it lifts the edges up. I put a Layla bar down with multiple fish hooks to pull the edge of the wound down so we can get a far lateral approach. Here is the spine with a laminectomy done and the facet joint removed on one side so that we can see laterally. What we then do is after opening the dura, we're looking at the dentate ligaments here and we have a, a posterior lateral view of the cord. We cut the dentate ligaments 
and we can then gently rotate the spinal cord and from a purely posterior approach we can see the ventral surface of the spinal cord. Here are three different cases showing a vascular malformation, dead ventral, that we can approach from posteriorly and avoid having to go through the spinal cord because not all patients can tolerate that like a three-year-old uh, child. Here's an example. This is a patient with an intramedullary spinal cord AVM. You can see here the anterior spinal artery making its characteristic hairpin turn, the AVM. Here is the intraoperative angiogram showing this anterior spinal artery and complete resection through that approach in the thoracic area. So I think there's a bright future for surgery in the management of spinal AVMs. Spinal cord cavernous malformations, there is no other option. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not been any uh, success in the use of radiosurgery, but these lesions, which can be devastating, even a minor hemorrhage can cause terrible myelopathy. You can see that these things have a very, very clear demarcation between the normal spinal cord and the malformation, and the surgical resection of them is one of the most rewarding things we do. Either approached through, in this case, a midline myelotomy or through the dorsal root entry zone, depending upon where the malformation and its associated hemorrhage comes closest to. Now, of all the things we do in neurosurgery, there have only been a handful of things that have been subjected to randomized clinical trials. This is one of them. Just about the time that numerous studies demonstrated the overwhelming benefit for carotid endarterectomy in the prevention of stroke over medical therapy, along comes another option, angioplasty and stenting, which also has been demonstrated to prevent stroke and is less invasive. So what is the role now and in the future of these different therapies. Just to refresh your memory, NACID, which was, was a randomized trial looking at the role of endarterectomy in symptomatic patients, for patients with high-grade stenosis, we need to treat six patients with endarterectomy to prevent one patient from having a stroke. That's pretty good. With a 50 to 69 percent stenosis, we have to treat 15 patients to prevent one from having a stroke. For asymptomatic disease, and this is very important, we have to do 67 carotid endarterectomies with no errors, no complications to prevent one patient from having a stroke. So the message is we need to be careful in recommending endarterectomy in asymptomatic patients. So what about angioplasty? The CREST trial uh, included 2,500 patients where they were randomized either to angioplasty and stenting or carotid endarterectomy. Um, what happened is that the surgical group had more myocardial infarctions, but the stenting group had more strokes, probably because the stenting group were all on Plavix and on um, uh, uh, statins. Um, stenting actually had better results for younger patients, and for older patients, actually better results for surgical therapy. The bottom line is, is that both of these procedures are safe and effective, but this gave us insight into a number of anatomical variations, calcification of the artery, and other problems that make angioplasty and stenting dangerous. And so I think there is clearly a role in the future for carotid endarterectomy in the management of stroke. What about when the carotid's occluded and we can't reopen it? I mean, uh, in that case, the uh, procedure of taking a superficial temporal artery and sewing it to the middle cerebral artery and doing a bypass seems like a logical, intuitive solution. Uh, proposed uh, back in the 1970s, early six, late 60s and 70s by Yastergill. That is another of our operations that was subjected to a randomized trial. And in that case, it was unequivocal. The indications for ECIC bypass were as crystal clear after that study done in the 1980s. There were no indications whatsoever. The patients that were randomized to medical therapy did equally as well as the patients randomized to surgery. So after that trial, it was discovered by a group at Washington University that if you did PET scans you could, and, and measured oxygen extraction fraction, you could identify patients whose brains, if you think of it teleologically, were extracting an, an excessive amount of oxygen from the brain. They, they were starved for, for um, blood. They demonstrated that group of patients had a much higher risk of stroke than patients who had normal oxygen extraction fraction, and it led to a second NIH-sponsored trial that we were part of, where we randomized patients to bypass or no bypass based upon whether or not they 
had an elevated oxygen extraction fraction. That study was halted prematurely, not because surgery was not demonstrated to be ineffective, but because the improvement in medical treatment of stroke had developed so far that we could never randomize enough patients to prove the benefit of surgery. And so today, I think the indications for ECIC bypass are a few, not none. Patients who have failed medical therapy, we strongly believe are good candidates. It is the treatment of choice, I believe, for Moya Moya disease, a rare, unusual disease uh, where the blood vessels of the brain become progressively occluded, and this is the kind of revascularization we can get. Uh, it is still, uh, as I said, important in patients with hemodynamic insufficiency that have failed best medical therapy. And this is the kind of result you can get. You can fill the entire brain through a temporal artery. So blood from the scalp now going to the brain can be uh, uh, life and health saving. Uh, here's a patient, a young man who has an occlusion at the top of his basilar artery. And uh, you'll never convince him that ECIC bypass isn't effective. I did a superficial temporal artery bypass. You can see the temporal artery here going underneath the temporal lobe to the posterior cerebral artery. His entire rostral brainstem is filled through that temporal artery. He was in his 20s at the time this was done. That was probably 25 years ago. He's never had another TIA since, but we've never studied that disease. The most common use for bypass today, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, is for aneurysms that are refractory to all other forms of therapy. Uh, and we uh, do a bypass uh, and occlude the parent artery that harbors the aneurysm. So that brings me to what I want to talk about for the remainder of the talk, probably among the most controversial issues when it comes to different therapeutic options, and that's the management of um, intracranial aneurysms. Um, some studies have suggested that endovascular therapy is superior to surgery for the management of ruptured aneurysms. Unfortunately, some of those very small studies that looked at a small group of patients have been extrapolated to the entire population of patients that harbor intracranial aneurysms. And this is a common error that occurs throughout medicine, where a study is done and the results are applied to a population that wasn't even studied. And this, I think, is the case to some degree with endovascular coiling. So here's the, here's the data. There have been three prospective randomized trials comparing surgery and endovascular therapy for ruptured intracranial aneurysms. The ISAT trial, the first of those, showed a benefit for surgery at one year, but no benefit, I mean for endovascular therapy at one year, but not at five years. The BRAT trial, the Barrow uh, ruptured aneurysm trial, showed a benefit for endovascular therapy at one year, but no benefit at three years, and more recently, no benefit at six years. And the Finnish study showed no benefit for endovascular therapy at one year. There was one matched control study done in Canada that showed the clipping was superior. And there are a number of concerns about endovascular therapy that remain, about its durability, the risk of rebleeding, the treatment morbidity, and the patient selection. This is the main problem with endovascular therapy, so-called coil compaction, which is basically a euphemism for failed therapy, and the higher incidence of rebleeding. So the durability of endovascular therapy is the problem. And so what is required is for people to work together as teams and to engage in appropriate clinical decision making. This is just a slide that shows our experience over about a 10 year period, close to 5,000 aneurysms over that period. You can see the ruptured and the unruptured, the, the breakdown of endovascular therapy and surgery in our institution. And I think this is about where it should be. This is not typical. In many institutions, the overwhelming majority of patients get endovascular therapy, and that's why there's a, upwards of a 25% incidence of recurrence. But I think by working together as a team and determining what the best treatment is for the individual patient is the best way to come up with uh, better outcomes. This is an example that I, I see not infrequently. This is a patient who needs an operation. They have, an, they have a hemorrhage in their brain that is life-threatening caused by this aneurysm. I have actually seen patients like this taken to an endovascular suite to have their aneurysm coiled and then taken to an operating room to have their clot removed. That is completely and totally illogical. Why would you put a patient through two procedures when one procedure can not only deal with both problems but do it in a more effective and a more permanent manner? So this is the kind of clinical decision making that I think has been distorted by applying data from studies inappropriately. There's some myths about surgery and about endovascular therapy. 
First, I want to talk about the myth of the subarachnoid hemorrhage, the myth that it's too dangerous to operate on a patient acutely after a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here's an aneurysm that bled. You can see the subarachnoid blood, not ideally suited for endovascular therapy, and the patient uh, is young. So this is a patient that needs surgery. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. But here's what you can do. Look at the brain. The brain's angry and swollen. One of the first things we do is I take a tuberculin syringe and I stick it into the sylvian fissure and inject air. Watch the air fill up the sylvian fissure. This is a trick to open the sylvian fissure so you can see it and then you can actually open the sylvian fissure rather than cutting into one of the uh, sylvian veins. By filling it with air and gradually and progressively opening the sylvian fissure, you can see, watch the brain relax as I open every arachnoid cistern. No retractors are used during this procedure. I try to avoid to the greatest extent possible. Here I open the lamina terminalis and watch the gush of cerebrospinal fluid that comes out uh, in a patient with an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, here's the optic chiasm. You can see the brain continuing to relax and relax. I put a temporary clip on the carotid artery. For the final stages of dissection, there's the carotid bifurcation aneurysm. Um, clip it under direct sight. Again, no retractors whatsoever. Uh, the brain is much, much more relaxed now. And one of the beauties of surgery is that we can get a perfect result. In endovascular therapy, there's a whole jargon of nearly complete, almost total, uh, neck remnant only. In surgery, we don't we don't settle for any of that. Here we take a little mini clip and we clip the little tiny dog ear remnant so we completely obliterate the aneurysm and it's, it's taken care of. And there's the postoperative, the intraoperative angiogram showing complete obliteration of the aneurysm and normal filling of the surrounding vasculature. Secondly is the myth of the posterior circulation. You can't operate on a, an aneurysm in the posterior circulation. It's too dangerous. Must be done by endovascular therapy. Here's a 52 year old woman. By my book, since I just turned 60 last month, that's really young. She has an incidental right internal carotid artery bifurcation aneurysm and underwent endovascular therapy for her basilar tip aneurysm. Here's her follow-up angiogram. So here's her basilar tip aneurysm, which has recurred, and here's her carotid aneurysm, which wasn't even treated. Why not do an operation and treat both of them at the same time? Completely illogical. So here's her reoperation. Again, by widely opening the sylvian fissure, without the use of any retractors whatsoever, by opening the sylvian fissure, this is now a year after her subarachnoid hemorrhage, so the brain has some thick arachnoid, but, um, but not the, the blood that we saw in the last opening. Here we are opening the membrane of Lilliquist and identifying the basilar aneurysm. Um, the, the arachnoids always thickened because of the prior subarachnoid hemorrhage, but in a moment you're going to see the coils of the basilar aneurysm uh, come into view right in here. There's the aneurysm, and you'll see the, the so-called coil compaction. There's the neck of the aneurysm right here. You get a view, you, there are the coils up in here that you can see uh, compacted and recurrence. And it's a very simple matter to clip this aneurysm. We have a beautiful view of the, of the perforators behind the uh, posterior cerebral arteries. And fortunately, the coils had compacted enough that it was not difficult to put a clip. You can see the coils right here. There's the neck of the aneurysm. And uh, not only in this 52-year-old woman do we eliminate this on a permanent basis so she doesn't have to undergo follow-up angiography and have routine maintenance, but upon clipping this aneurysm, the anterior circulation aneurysm is literally right here. Here's the carotid bifurcation aneurysm. And in my opinion, I think both of these aneurysms should have been treated by a surgical procedure at the, first, uh, at the outset. There you can see the second aneurysm. Uh, this is a very simple thing to treat. There's the clip going on, uh, and uh, Bob's your uncle. There's the intraoperative angiogram showing uh, obliteration of both of the aneurysms and no need for routine uh, maintenance in the future. So the biggest problem with endovascular therapy are patients that have neck, wide-necked aneurysms. That's where the greatest recurrences occur. And in all fairness, the, the advances are startling. We do have tools now, balloon remodeling, um, uh, stent coiling, and flow diversion, the one that's approved by the FDA being pipeline. 
The problem with these tools for wide neck aneurysms is if you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the need for dual antiplatelet therapy basically eliminates, for all practical purposes, those two options. And so for subarachnoid hemorrhage, we also have tools for wide neck aneurysms. They're called aneurysm clips. And here's the benefit is the durability and the versatility of surgery. There's virtually no aneurysm we can't figure out a surgical treatment for. Here's a gentleman who has a wide-necked anterior communicating artery aneurysm. This would be treatable by endovascular means, but you'd have to do some handstands uh, in order to do this. Here's the surgical treatment. Again, if you open the sylvian fissure widely, get brain relaxation, Without any retractors at all, you can see the aneurysm here, the large aneurysm. Temporary clip placed on the A1 segment to soften the sac during the final stages of dissection. I can now see behind the clip, I mean behind the uh, aneurysm to identify the hypothalamic perforators in the A2. In this case, we use a fenestrated clip to push the closing pressure further distally. So I'm purposefully leaving aneurysm passing through the fenestration. And then I'll clip that with a straight clip, the so-called tandem clipping technique first described by Sugita. Here's some residual aneurysm underneath the clip, and so now the temporary clip is off, and I can leisurely put another fenestrated clip to obliterate that part of the aneurysm. Again, the benefit of surgery being the fact that we can be so precise and so perfect in our results that there isn't any remnant left whatsoever. ICG video angiography causes fluorescence, I can see the anterior communicating complex fill, so I'm confident we've accomplished our goals. But in our institution, we routinely also do intraoperative angiography, which you can see here. Here's the before. You can see the aneurysm completely obliterated, a normal filling of the surrounding vasculature. Here's another example of a very controversial area. This is a guy, obviously, has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. His aneurysm is right here, one of these blister aneurysms, which are absolutely treacherous. If you just look at these things wrong during surgery, they will rupture and bleed, and all kinds of ways have been developed to try to treat them, including flow diversion and stents, which again requires this dual antiplatelet therapy, which is dangerous. Here's a 3D angiogram showing the blister aneurysm. I always do an external carotid injection, because if I have to sacrifice the carotid, I want to be sure that I have a vessel to do a bypass. But here's the treatment that we've used on a number of these now. Here's the optic nerve. There's the blister aneurysm right there. So I don't even touch the blister. What I do is I sharply dissect on the opposite wall of the blister aneurysm. This is the free edge of the tentorium. The third nerve is going to be down here, posterior communicating artery here. I then take a piece of Gore-Tex, just that your cardiac surgeons use, and I cut a strip with a little point on it. I've not dissected at all where the blister is. So I slide this Gore-Tex between the anterior process and the posterior communicating artery very gently slide it down, and then I will grasp it and pull it up and completely wrap the blister, which is right here. If you try to dissect this out, it'll rupture and bleed. But in this case now, the Gore-Tex is then lifted up and we just simply clip the Gore-Tex circumferentially around the carotid artery, uh, and it will heal uh, beautifully in every case. The other benefit of this is that if you have a perforator like the anterior choroidal or the posterior communicator, you can cut a slit in the Gore-Tex to accommodate a perforator. I didn't have to do that in this case. Now this is a very uh, instructive case for a number of reasons. First of all, it shows the technique. What you want to do is, is, is narrow the lumen of the artery ever so slightly so that you are compressing the uh, blister aneurysm. So we do ICG video angiography to prove that the artery is open. Here you see the posterior communicating and you see the carotid artery and the reconstructed Gore-Tex and you see that it fills. But here's the beauty of intraoperative angiography. We did an intraoperative angiogram and looked that even though it fills, look how I've narrowed the carotid artery too much and look at the delayed filling of the middle cerebral artery. So seeing that, I immediately go back in and just simply let the clip come up a millimeter, literally one millimeter, and here's the repeat intraoperative angiogram with a perfect reconstruction of the artery. And I think this is a better option than an endovascular option that requires dual antiplatelet therapy. Here's an aneurysm. You can see a part of it here at the top of the, on, the, on the posterior cerebral artery. But this aneurysm, as you can imagine, is huge. It's filled up with clot and thrombus. If you coil that aneurysm, it's going to recur in, in a few days because the coils will migrate. 
But here's the surgical procedure. This is under the left temporal lobe. This is the posterior communicating artery. This is the P1, I'm sorry, P2. That's the P1. Here's the aneurysm compressing the brain stem. This is the left tentorium. So a temporary clip is put on the P1. Here's the posterior communicator going to the carotid. This is the P2 segment being elevated up. So we're going to trap the posterior cerebral artery and open the aneurysm with a number 11 knife blade to take that clot out so that we can safely clip it. There's no possible way to do that endovascularly because the coils would just migrate into that clot and there will be a very early and aggressive recurrence. So here's the clot being removed. It's a boy. <laughs> and then we can take these fenestrated clips and reconstruct the lumen of the, of the curve of the posterior cerebral artery. That, that lumen, that uh, fenestration, accom accom uh, ac accomplishes the um, uh, encirclement of the posterior cerebral artery but the blades obliterate the aneurysm. We remove the temporary clips and um, we've completely reconstructed it uh, uh, in a perfect manner. So another aneurysm that just simply can't be treated by endovascular means. Sometimes aneurysms are too small to treat by endovascular means. Sometimes they're too large to treat by endovascular means. So in summary for surgery, I would say that surgery is not minimally invasive, but it certainly should be minimally disruptive. We should not leave any traces of what it is that we have, 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 have done, uh, very similar to what we see here. And so the last part of this talk, what I want to talk about is how do we accomplish this? How do we, how do we get better if surgery does provide a better option for patients, it's only if we're doing it with minimization of complications. So I want to close by talking about how we avoid and manage intraoperative misadventures. The best way to manage a complication is to avoid it. And some of the worst complications that I've made in my life is operating on the wrong patient. There is an alternative to surgery, and we need to embrace those and utilize them appropriately, and there are patients who are ideal candidates for these minimally invasive or less invasive options, and we need to work with colleagues who uh, can do that. Colin Powell once said, there are no secrets to success. It's the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure, and we all learn from our failures. We learn a lot more from our failures than we do from our successes, and somebody can get up in front of you and show you great cases and great outcomes, and you can go away saying, wow, I can do that. But it's sharing your, your failures that I think makes you a better decision maker, better physician, and a better surgeon, and quite frankly, better in every aspect of life if you can assess your failures and learn from them. So I've already mentioned the most important thing to preventing and avoiding a complication is patient selection. There are some patients who just simply are not good candidates for surgery. There are some patients which probably shouldn't treat. They're probably better off living with the natural history of the disease. But then to, to prevent intraoperative misadventures, we also want to avoid direct injury to the brain. We want to make sure that we don't incompletely obliterate the aneurysm, that we get rid of it completely, if that's one of the advantages. We can't compromise the parent vessels. We have to learn to avoid and deal with intraoperative rupture and then meticulously care for our patients. And although I'm focusing on aneurysm surgery, many of these principles apply to all other types of surgery. One of the most important things is optimal exposure. The, the terional approach is the workhorse for vascular neurosurgery. This is an inadequate terional approach. This lesser wing of the sphenoid <clears throat> has not been removed appropriately, so when you open the dura, you can't get to the aneurysm without retracting the brain. We, we want to minimize retraction of the brain, and so the appropriate exposure is to drill the lesser wing of the sphenoid so it's flat. If you're operating on a proximal carotid aneurysm, maybe even unroof the orbit and remove the anterior clinoid process. And then you have this kind of exposure where the entire sylvian fissure is open and you don't have to use retractors. So the brain doesn't like being retracted. At least mine doesn't. And people in Georgia don't like their having, having their brains retracted. This is the kind of brain relaxation you can get. This is a patient with an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. I mean, look at all the blood. That wasn't from my opening. That was actually from an aneurysm. And with opening all the cisterns sequentially, that's the kind of relaxation one can get if you're careful and you open every cistern in the lamina terminalis and avoid uh, retraction of the brain. This is, a, this is a picture I took from one of my early videos, early in my career, of, a, of an unruptured superior hypothesial aneurysm reconstructed beautifully with fenestrated clips, because that's what I was focusing on early in my career. 
What I should be focusing on are these two retractors, you know, hogging on the frontal and the temporal lobes. I get sick to my stomach when I look back at this, but this is the way I used to do this, and I try to avoid that now. Here's a, a middle cerebral artery aneurysm. Look at the, when the sylvian fissure is open, this is an unruptured aneurysm, but look at the view one gets. Why would you even think of doing this endovascularly when you've got a wide-necked aneurysm and you get this kind of exposure? This is, this is, to the patient, this is like doing an appendectomy. They go home, you know, shortly after, I'm sorry, what did I just do? What did I push? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. I thought I had a fatal default there. So, and here's, here's the picture of the aneurysm clipped. Uh, no retraction whatsoever, just dynamic retraction with the instruments. Now sometimes you have to retract the brain. This is a young pediatric patient with a ruptured basal or tip aneurysm. Here's the tentorium, the free edge of the tentorium. This is the temporal lobe. But when you use a retractor, don't, don't do what we've all seen where you put that retractor in and you hog and the brain's you know, getting cut by the retractor. We put multiple retractors and evenly distribute the force gently so that the retractor is really just simply protecting the brain, not hogging on the brain, as we say in Illinois. I think vein preservation is ignored. We all focus on the arteries. We don't look at the venous phase of arteriograms anymore. We don't, many of our medical students and residents don't even know the names of the veins of the brain that we had to learn back in the, in the dark ages when Anil and I uh, used angiograms to diagnose brain tumors. Uh, and I think it's a lost art. But I think a lot of the troubles we have postoperatively is from venous congestion and venous infarction that's unrecognized. Here's a middle cerebral artery aneurysm on the left side, and particularly on the left side, the dominant side of the brain, meticulous dissection of veins is absolutely essential. I think so many times when we blame our bad results on the anesthesiologist or the nurse or the resident, it's really the destruction of veins. Uh, that is the problem. And you can see that you don't have to coagulate veins. Here are the aneurysms clipped, and, and in this case, the veins look like they're in pretty good shape, and, and the brain is much happier if it can drain blood back to the heart and lungs. Exposures and approaches, you've got to pick the right approach. I'm going to show you two basal or tip aneurysms, exactly the same aneurysm that required two completely different approaches. This is a basilar tip aneurysm with a high bifurcation. This is the anterior clinoid process. Look how high up in the interpeduncular fossa that aneurysm is. This patient also had a middle cerebral artery aneurysm on the left, so I approached it from the left side. The only way to see up there is to do an orbitozygomatic extension so you can look up into the interpeduncular fossa and look at the view that I have at the time of surgery. This little retractor is a little mini retractor literally on the mammillary body. That's how high up it is. But I'm looking up into the interpeduncular fossa. That's the mammillary body. There's the aneurysm. Temporary clip is placed. Look at the view I have of the perforators. These are the thalamo perforators behind the basilar aneurysm. Look at the leash of them. Any one of those gets occluded or kinked, it's toast for the patient. Those are the vessels Charlie Drake recognized he was clipping when he was the first to successfully do this operation. The fenestrated clip is used to encompass the P1. I can see the perforators beautifully, but it's because I did the right approach, looking up into the interpeduncular fossa. The fenestration encompasses the, the P1. Here's the intraoperative angiogram showing the, the vessel going through the P1, the aneurysm gone. Now, here's exactly the same aneurysm, basal or tip aneurysm. But notice how the P1s are reaching up to the tentorium. This is a very, very low bifurcation. If I did an orbozygomatic, I wouldn't even see the aneurysm. So the same aneurysm requires a totally different approach, in this case, a subtemporal approach that is done, in this case, on the right side. Here's the tentorium. There's the oculomotor nerve. Here are the two retractors, as I said, gently. Uh, keeping the, the, this out of the way. By putting a stitch in the free edge of the tentorium, not where the fourth nerve runs, but away from that, that gives you literally a few millimeters of additional view. And look how the panoramic view. So now I can see the aneurysm. There's the neck. There's the P1 on the left, P1 on the right. I look behind the aneurysm, and I get that same view that I had from the orbitozygomatic approach. Look at the perforators back here. Tiny vessels, but all supplying some very high-priced real estate. 
same thing. I use a fenestrated clip. I can see the other P1. I can be absolutely confident that I'm not incorporating any of those thalamus perforators. There's one right here I'm holding out of the way. Purposefully letting this part of the neck pass through the fenestration. There's the thalamus perforator right here. I see it very well. I know it's safe. And in this case, I will use a second fenestrated clip to obliterate this portion of the aneurysm passing through the first fenestration, but I wanted to be sure I could see. So the view that you get from two completely different approaches are absolutely essential for the same aneurysm simply because of a minor anatomic variant between the two. There's the second clip going on to obliterate uh, the aneurysm, the P1 passing through the fenestration, um, and uh, the aneurysm completely obliterated. The other problem we have to avoid is incomplete obliteration. If indeed the benefit of surgery is that we can completely eliminate the aneurysm, we can't have an air ball like this or else we really haven't accomplished that goal. And there are a lot of things we can do to document we've obliterated the aneurysm. One of the most important being observation under the operating microscope, uh, which is useful but not 100% effective. Here's a intraoperative angiogram showing a residual anterior communicating artery aneurysm and our ability to obliterate it. Here's ICG video angiography, which can allow us to see continued filling after clipping. That's another tool that we commonly use. Um, one of the other problems we want to avoid is compromise of normal vasculature. This is an unruptured aneurysm that was treated. Everything seemed to go fine, but obviously we injured a perforator uh, that uh, caused a postoperative stroke. We used to depend upon postoperative angiography, but I think that slide, excuse me, that slide shows you when you get a postoperative angiogram and you see this, uh, the cat's out of the barn. And so um, now we use intraoperative angiography. Here's a giant thrombotic middle cerebral artery aneurysm. It's uh, clipped, but obviously there's a hole here. Knowing that intraoperative, it allows us to rapidly uh, reconfigure the clips and reconstruct the middle cerebral artery. So we use intraoperative angiography routinely. There are a number of clipping strategies that we can use to avoid um, compromise of the intracranial circulation, but sometimes aneurysms are truly intractable. We simply cannot clip them or coil them, and that's when the modern neurovascular surgeon needs to be adept at bypass procedures. This is a young boy from Africa who was sent over with this uh, fusiform aneurysm of the middle cerebral artery. You can see the afferent and the efferent vessels. He'd had a subarachnoid hemorrhage from which he'd made a good recovery. And uh, here is the, his surgery. We literally opened up his sylvian fissure to the very, very depths. And here you can see the aneurysm deep in the sylvian fissure. Here's the artery coming into it, a branch of the middle cerebral artery. And there's an artery coming out of it on the surface. One of the tricks is to do ICG video angiography and you can figure out which one of these it is. In this case, we spared the superficial temporal artery on the opening, so we occlude the vessel coming out of the aneurysm, make a little opening, uh, and we do a superficial temporal artery to middle cerebral artery bypass um, first and foremost. So we've revascularized the middle cerebral artery beyond the aneurysm. Here's the bypass in place, pulsating. Now what we can do is trap the aneurysm by putting a clip on the proximal um, uh, middle cerebral artery right in front of the aneurysm another one distally, and we actually open the aneurysm and um, eliminate the, uh, the thrombus. Here's the intraoperative angiogram. You can see this hole right here, but when we inject the external carotid artery, you can see the bypass filling that, and this child did, did, did uh, perfectly well. Sometimes the temporal artery isn't adequate. This is a man with a massive aneurysm compressing his brain stem, only a small portion of which is filling on angiography. And we anticipated that we either would have to sacrifice his carotid or at minimum have a prolonged uh, temporary occlusion. In this case, we harvested the radial artery from the arm, which you can see here. And I just will show you a very short portion of this, uh, just a couple of technical things. This is the, this is the um, middle cerebral artery, the recipient vessel. Uh, we make an opening with an ophthalmic knife, which I think is a nice way to make the arteriotomy. Um, the, the radial artery is sewn in place. Um, I do this by putting a tack down suture at the front and the back, 
and then run the suture along one side, tie it to the tail of this one, run this one along this way, and tie it to the tail of the other one. So the running suture allowing us to do the bypass in a more rapid manner to minimize the occlusion and ischemic uh, time. Once that's done, then uh, the final suture is tied, and when we take off the temporary clips, you can see the pulsations of the uh, radial artery. Another trick, this is the common carotid artery for the proximal part of the, of the bypass. One of the tricks I like to use is after making the opening, I use one of these coronary punches that the cardiac surgeons use that punches a beautiful hole in the artery. And look how nice and clean it makes uh, the old hole. We irrigate it with heparinized saline and, um, and then do the proximal uh, uh, anastomosis um, in an endocide manner to the common carotid artery so there's some blood flow to the brain during uh, the time we're doing this. Now, I'm going to forward ahead. In this particular case, this is the intraoperative angiogram. We actually were able to clip the aneurysm, as you can see. And here's the bypass. But that bypass provided blood to the brain during the long period of time we had to remove the anterior process, uh, cavitron out the clot from the aneurysm, uh, something the patient wouldn't have tolerated without the bypass. Here's a patient with a giant vertebral aneurysm, which you can see here. Here's on the arteriogram. You can see the massive aneurysm here. Uh, no endovascular option for treating this uh, aneurysm. So what we did at the operation uh, for this fellow, here's his brain stem, here's the aneurysm. Market is storting the, the medulla. Here's the vertebral artery where the aneurysm arises. And we'll identify pica. Here's the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. And we take advantage of the fact that this pica, which we have to sacrifice, and the pica here, the tonsillar loops, are right next to each other. And so what we'll do is a side-to-side -side anastomosis of the two picas, so they'll be kissing. A permanent clip is placed here since we're going to uh, occlude that artery. Temporary clips here. And this looks complicated, but it's actually a very straightforward bypass if you think it through. You make an arteriotomy on both picas. This is the most important stitch, is the anchor stitch, which you put in the apex of one pica to the apex of the other. So you tie it so the knot is outside of the lumen of the artery. And then, unlike the superficial temporal artery bypass where we use interrupted sutures, you have to use a running suture so you don't have knots on the inside of the lumen. And once you tie this first knot, the, the, the tonsillar loops of pica are kissing. And then it's a very simple manner to sew the inner lumen here to the inner lumen here up to the apex and then reverse the stitch so you end up completing your bypass. The, the downside of this bypass is that you potentially are putting both picas at risk. If you, if you dilly-dally, uh, you can have uh, ischemic time that can affect both picas. But see, all we're doing is sewing the inside. It doesn't take very long at all. You can see the stitch is going from this inside. So the lumen's here for this pica and the lumen is here for this pica, so you just don't want to grab the back wall. And once you reach the apex, then we just simply reverse the, um, reverse the um, thing. And here you can see the ICG showing the bypass uh, filling. And we decompress the, the um, uh, brain stem, and here's the uh, intraoperative angiogram showing uh, the bypass and the aneurysm completely gone. I want to end, and I'll do this quickly, but I think one of the worst complications, the, the, the mother-in-law of all complications during aneurysm surgery, uh, excuse me, uh, is, uh, is, um, is intraoperative rupture. And like most things, this is better, better avoided than, than, than managed. But if you never have to manage this, you're either lying or you're not doing any aneurysm surgery. So I just want to briefly give you a couple of tips on this because I think it helps. First of all, avoid blunt dissection. Every study has demonstrated that sharp dissection minimizes the risk. This is what blunt dissection does. Um, and um, I know that looks like a routine case for Anil, but, but that, that actually <laughs> is not supposed to happen for those residents here who have never seen this done right. 
So when you do have an intraoperative rupture, you've got to manage it properly, and then you've still got to repair the aneurysm. You've got to achieve the goal that you were there for. So the literature is full of all kinds of tricks, some of which are good and some of which are bad. And let me just close by giving you a couple of, of options. If the aneurysm ruptures after you've, expo you've exposed it, that is not a problem, as long as you keep your wits about you. If you've got the aneurysm exposed, as we do here, you simply put a temporary clip on, you identify the bleeding site, and in this case, with a middle cerebral artery aneurysm, actually, the, the, the ideal thing is to put a temporary clip on the aneurysm so you can take the temporary clip off the M1, as we've done here, and really minimize the ischemic time. So that generally can be managed if you just, as I said, keep your wits about you. In this case, temporary clip is put on. We then put a permanent clip on, take off the temporary clip, and that really is not a big, big issue. The bigger problem is when the aneurysm ruptures before exposure. I mentioned that I try not to use retractors, but I always have a retractor on, a buddy retractor with an arm ready, and here's the reason why. This aneurysm prematurely ruptured before we'd even seen it. So I immediately, I put, I'm sorry, yeah, put my retractor in. Here, the reason I put this retractor in is I've not really identified the aneurysm yet, so this is a premature hemorrhage. I put a little piece of cotton gently and then I take the retractor and I use it as a third arm to gently hold that cotton in place. Now I've got two free hands. I can identify the carotid artery. I put a temporary clip on the carotid artery. Again, the most important thing is keep your wits about you. Don't start throwing things and yelling and panicking. Trap the aneurysm. Now my third arm has is is accomplished its goal. I lift this off. A little piece of, of fluffy cotton I removed. The back bleeding is now from the posterior communicating artery aneurysm, but that's perfectly manageable. I dissect out the neck of the aneurysm, which is right here. You can see where it tore up against the free edge of the tentorium, where it always tears. Put the permanent clip on. Take off the temporary clips. Temporary occlusion is a minute or two at the most. Reconstructed. I put another clip in to reconstruct this more perfectly, and that is a way to bail yourself out of an intraoperative rupture. And I could show you multiple examples of that. Uh, here's the thing completely reconstructed. The ICG shows that the anterior choroidal and the posterior communicating fill and everything turned out great. Here's another option. This is a man who came in with a temporal lobe clot. Got a CTA, took him straight to surgery. It was a middle cerebral artery aneurysm. Literally upon opening the dura, this is what we saw. We opened the dura and had just begun to open the sylvian fissure and there's massive bleeding. In this case, two large bore suctions, everything I had, I could not control the bleeding. So we give the patient adenosine. Give adenosine, it stops the heart for 20, 30 seconds. Most of the time it starts back after that, and if it doesn't, you can shock the patient. And <laughs> I've never had that happen, but it, most of the time it starts back. But watch, watch what happens, watch what happens when you give adenosine. I asked calmly my anesthesiologist, please give the patient adenosine. Watch what happens as the heart stops. That torrential bleeding, there's the hole in the aneurysm. I can see it, the heart stops. I suck it up, put a temporary clip on. Now, I got a temporary clip on the aneurysm, heart has started again, and I can leisurely reconstruct this aneurysm as though it were an unruptured case. And I don't use this often, but the times I've used it, it has been absolutely life-saving, and it's a trick. Here's the reconstructed uh, artery and um, the, post the intraoperative angiogram showing, and this patient made an incredible, perfectly good recovery. He has uh, uh, no deficits. The stepmother-in-law of all <laughs> complications is when you not only tear the aneurysm, but you tear it at the neck. The problem then being that you, you, when it tears the neck, if you try to put a clip more proximally, you occlude the parent artery. So Robert Spetzler and I, um, a few years ago, kind of independently were discussing this thing we had used over the years where if you have a neck tear, rather than putting a clip here and compromising the vessel, if you put a piece of cotton to increase the surface area and you put the clip exactly where you had it before, you, you actually can compress that site. And I want to close by giving you just a couple of examples. Here's a middle cerebral artery aneurysm exposed to the sylvian fissure. Here's the aneurysm, there's the M2 and the other M2. I have a temporary clip on the M1, here's the other M2. I use a fenestrated clip to reconstruct the middle cerebral artery bifurcation, uh, the tandem clipping technique again, where I'm gonna, 
allow some of the neck to pass through the fenestration, take the temporary clip off. Here's the part of the neck passing through the fenestration. I put a straight clip on it. And um, rather than being uh, happy, as they say, the enemy of good is better. Uh, this is perfectly fine, but I decide I'm going to gild the lily a little bit and look around and make sure everything's absolutely perfect. And as I, as I do that, you can see this patient's got a fair amount of atherosclerosis. As I do that, I tear the neck right there. If I move this clip right there, I've, that, that M2 branch is, is, is hosed. So I put the temporary clip back on. I take a little piece of cotton. I open up the original clip and I put it right back exactly where it was. But by increasing the surface area with the cotton, it tamponades the bleeding site, yet is able to keep the M2 branches both open. And once that's reclipped, temporary clip is removed, and um, it all turned out great. The very last case, this is a patient with um, an anterocroidal aneurysm and a posterior communicating aneurysm. Here's the posterior communicating aneurysm. There's a big, huge anterior choroidal back here. So as I'm dissecting this small posterior communicating aneurysm, here's the anterior choroidal. I rip it right at the neck. I mean, there is no way to clip that without compromising the carotid. So here's the posterior communicating aneurysm. So what I do is I take a little piece of cotton. I love cotton, as you can tell. And I, and I, and I put it right over the site, and it's, it's so absorbent, it, it stops the bleeding. I think I also have a piece of gel foam with this as well. So what I'm going to do now, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, so I go ahead and clip the posterior communicating aneurysm, keeping my, my hand here, and get that out of the way. Now I've got to deal with this large, complicated anterior choroidal aneurysm with a tear right at the neck. So again, what we do, I have the retractor in place in case I need that third arm. Here's the proximal carotid, here's the optic nerve. So once I, I, I get it with some, some cotton and gel foam, I get it kind of tamponaded. I'll put a temporary clip on the carotid to decrease the pressure. And I got this bleeding temporarily because it's obviously not permanent. Here's the huge anterior choroidal. Here's the carotid bifurcation. There's the anterior choroidal artery right here. You can see it right there in this big anterior choroidal aneurysm. So what I'll do is I put the cotton right where the tear is. I use a fenestrated clip to clip the cotton right down onto the tear on the aneurysm. And the fenestration reconstructs the carotid, the M1 um, uh, origin right here. So in summary, I think there are a number of things that we can do to improve the outcomes of our patients, which is ultimately why we're all here, uh, to work together as a team. I strongly believe in subspecialization. I think that uh, whether it's you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken saying we do chicken right because they don't do other things, um, or whether it's in neurosurgery where somebody focuses in an area, most people don't make major contributions in more than one small area within their specialty. I don't care if you're a banker, a lawyer, a physician, and I think that applies to neurosurgery. We've got to re get really good at what we do. Collaboration is absolutely essential. Despite some of the disparaging remarks I made about endovascular therapy, I am a strong proponent of endovascular therapy, of radiosurgery. These are tools that are very important, but they need to be used in the proper context by collaborating with colleagues um, that we um, trust. And then I think it's got to be imperative that throughout our careers, we assess our complications, we talk about them, and we figure out how we can do better. So we've got to know our complications, and we've got to manage them. I think when it comes to the role of microvascular surgery in the future, I think there is an absence today of conclusive data to determine the superiority of one treatment over the other. I think that applying the results of a very selected study to the, the population at large is very, very dangerous, and I think we're guilty of doing it. Wide necked aneurysms are the most unfavorable for endovascular therapy, and those adjuncts that have improved our ability to deal with them really are not appropriate for patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. The risk of rebleeding, of retreatment, and obliteration clearly favor clipping. Picking which treatment for which patient really remains an art, uh, not entirely a science. But microsurgery is not a static field. For those of you that are in your training or going out into practice, 
keep up your microsurgical skills because I'm concerned that we may not be adequately training the next generation to do all the things we'll need to do in order to be able to manage patients effectively. But collaborative efforts are absolutely mandatory. None of us do what we do in isolation. And as I said in the beginning, and I'll close with, surgery is not minimally invasive, but she minimally disruptive. So the question I asked in the beginning, is there a future for neurovascular surgery? Absolutely. Asking that question today would have been like asking the question in the 1980s, is there a future for spinal neurosurgery? Because when, when orthopedic surgeons began putting metal in people's backs, there were neurosurgeons who said, oh my God, we're gonna be out of the spine business because we don't do that. Well, with all due respect to the orthopedic surgeons in the audience, if you can teach an orthopedic surgeon to put a pedicle screw in, I, I suspect we can probably teach our neurosurgeons to do that, and we did. We did a great job of it. And neurosurgery now actually leads the field in spinal instrumentation. And so today for a young man or woman who wants to be a cerebrovascular surgeon to say, oh my God, there's no future for for vascular neurosurgery because of endovascular techniques, learn those techniques. It's just another tool that we use, that we bring to the patient's bedside to be able to provide them the very best care. So just like we shouldn't have asked 20 years ago, is there a future for spinal neurosurgery? Don't be asking if there's a future for vascular neurosurgery. It's a bright future. Thank you again for your attention and for the honor of being able to deliver this lecture on behalf of the levies. Thanks. What you witnessed was just a technical virtuosity of uh, Dr. Barrow. I just want to remind the med students that are here that Alexis Carroll got the Nobel Prize in medicine, I think, in the year 1910 for first suturing a vessel together. So in a sense, he's you know, pushed that art further. I'd also like to mention to the med students here that Justin Haydell is sitting here with his fiance, Beverly, who will be graduating this year today after seven years of neurosurgical training. It's a long road, and we appreciate all of you being here. So there's a little, little uh, plaque on our behalf. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, man. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.